started all right ladies and gentlemen let's quickly invite our fabulous set of panelists over here because we are talking about marketing automation reigns supreme well that's our final panel discussion for the day and spearheading this panel discussion we have one of the most regular stalwart speakers also a moderator herself and we have none other than the director marketing india and south asia with ibm dipali nair so please put your hands together to welcome dipali nair on the stage and with and with that i'm going to also bring on our set of uh, panelists so well up next uh, let me now invite uh, mr tushar ghagwe who, who's with thomas cook and sotc travel in fact he's somebody who comes with more than uh, 19 years of uh, experience as a marketing professional so warm welcome tushar well let's quickly move on and invite our next speaker as well we have ataz gulrez alam If I may please invite Mr. Gulrez to please come on the stage as well. He's a Chief Investment and Strategy Officer with Apple, and uh, he also comes with more than 15 years of experience and drives Apple Group's strategy and investments. Time to invite our next speaker. We have with us Sarika Nayak, who's a Chief Marketing Officer and Chairperson, Diversity and Inclusion India with Cap Gemini. It was wonderful to hear her question back in the morning in one of the sessions, and it's wonderful to see her here as a panelist. She comes with nearly two decades of rich and diverse industry experience. Uh, let's bring upon our next speaker. We have with us Vishwajit Parashar, who's a group marketing head with Bajaj Capital. That's right. We love that enthusiasm there. And uh, he, in fact, is a performance-driven marketer with more than 17 years of uh, experience and success in developing highly successful marketing programs. Time to invite our next speaker, Amit Setia, who's the head of marketing with Cisco Group, a marketing strategist with Ponsha for creating and establishing regional and pan-India brands, doing that for the last 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, final panel discussion, final round of applause, and a very, very energetic one there. Zoda se yeah let's hear it because it's Dipali moderating it with that over to you yeah. thank you very much kavya uh, we have a very uh, interesting panelists here because they all come from different industries uh, and you've been hearing about data and content and consumer journeys since the morning that's what uh, you know i kind of gathered from various people who've been here apologies i wasn't here in the morning but i came in just now so i'm going to straight hit the topic that we have which is marketing automation and what i really want to do is that the three different industries that we have here with tushar from travel and you know vishwajit uh, 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 with uh, bajaj finance and uh, amit who works with siska uh, i want the three of you first to tell me in the last two years what are some of the most important changes that you brought in in the space of marketing automation within your organizations tushar if i can request you to start uh, so uh, as you are aware uh, travel is a very very roi focused industry uh, most of the automation that we do happens on our acquired customer so for example if we are acquiring a customer through any medium but he comes to our website and doesn't fill up a lead uh, then we run an automation on him by the way of dynamic remarketing and we'll try we try to acquire that customer in terms of demand generation because key marketing kpi is demand generation for us right uh, se- secondly we'll run an automation uh, for the customers to cross sell and upsell so we are selling a product he has purchased a holiday from us and now we want to sell uh, for example he has purchased say thailand holiday from us and now we want to sell him europe holiday so so then how do we upsell and how how do we not spend on the same customer to acquire again so for that we we use automation so we use automation tools to send him web notifications or say emailers sms and the, these are based on journeys that we have created depending on what he has done with us or how he has transacted with us uh, we we also uh, do some automations in terms of lead propensity this is again to uh, do with uh, uh, upselling and cross selling uh, so that we understand what customers purchase behavior is how he has uh, transacted with us and if there is a propensity for him to buy from us more so so that's where automation comes in where we uh, try and uh, you know b- bring in loyalty and try try to upsell to the same customer uh, who is already acquired whether in terms of website visit or in terms of lead so that's where we take the automation so when you're talking about propensity are you saying you're doing data modeling to predict 
uh, his propensity to buy that product yes, from you? Yes, to buy what? Uh, buy what? As in, if he has bought, say, uh, a domestic holiday, whether uh, he'll be inclined to buy, uh, say, Australia next year or some other destination next year. So we are we are doing that kind of lead propensity with a tool and uh, with a consultant we are working, and then uh, you know we try to upsell him that product, and we are still tracking the result and seeing how it will benefit us in the future. That's a very interesting innovation. I remember, uh, you know, about five years ago when I was working with Mindra Holidays, there used to be a company in the US, Wyndham Group actually, uh, because in US the uh, people's financial data is very readily available. Uh, they were in the timeshare business. They used to do data modeling to actually get a score on whether to even uh, show an ad to that person or not at all. So they would do segmentation uh, and do data modeling propensity to even say whether we want to reach out to this person or not. And they'd make an offer uh, only if they thought that this person had the capability financially uh, you know, to buy. So it's not about financial strength, but also about you know, whether that person will take on a 10 year, 15 year commitment in the space of timeshare. So I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that therefore, that you know, we're doing that kind of data modeling also in India. Vishwajit, now on to you. You know my love for financial services, yes. Uh, so Vishwajit and I, by the way, share our birthday. Huh? So oh, special love for Vishwajit. So first of all, thank you very much for giving this opportunity, Deepali. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Right? To I, may I? And I would like to thank all of you because I was chatting with someone and somebody said, Subha se AI, ML, data and cross-selling, up-selling, these words I think they know more than us what we're going to share with them, right? So with due respect to all the panelists, uh, I would say last two years, because I'm right fresh from the review session, so I can tell you very clearly what I've done last two years. Uh, the first thing is, uh, we were more of a brick and mortar model. So 50 year old organization with 207 point of purchase in 100 cities. Now to convert this kind of an organization, which is, has a very traditional way of doing business, to bring, bring it to them to the digital phase is itself a challenge. So what we did, we changed the complete business model because there is a fintech which is competing with us and there are old companies which are also competing with us. So what we need to do was to have a new strategy which will be relevant for the customer. So what we realize in financial service industry, the most important thing is the personalization. And suppose you are investing money, mutual funds, bonds, insurance, you want to talk to someone. So if it is a SIP or a term plan, there are uh, tech models where you can go and do them, do invest through them. But if there is a portfolio is a little bigger, you have to invest, let's say, 10 lakh rupees, 50 lakh rupees. You want somebody to talk to, somebody who can understand them, and somebody who can give a very customized kind of a portfolio advice to them. So we made a strategy of tech plus touch. That is what we believe in and is going to be the future for financial services, which is... So we, we feel that we are in a very special uh, you know, uh, space where we already have a point of purchase. So we, what we need to do add was tech. So we, we really changed the complete model. So now in almost all 100 cities where we have this, uh, the, the touch, we have made tech enabled service to our customers, our clients. And uh, you know, so they can do uh, through tech if there is a small transaction, but if they want to talk to someone, there is a, uh, there is a financial advisor who is right, not right available at, at the, at this, this is one phone, call away, one phone call away. So one big strange, uh, strategy which we changed was the complete model itself. The second was the 50 year old organization, a lot of data was lying in silos. So, uh, and, and both these data were not talking to each other. So I think last two years what we changed was we made a central repository, what we call as a data lake. And where all these uh, silos, so who needs this? Who needs these insights from the data? The most important insight was required by the relationship manager at the ground, more than the head office. So when he's talking to a client, he needs a, uh, he needs a true, complete view of the client. What is his history? So we made, uh, we made him more, uh, you know, uh, empowered him to go and talk to client and give more powerful advice, considering his past history, considering his, you know, financial treatments, credit score, etc. Based on that, we, you know, we tried to empower him on the on-ground service. And the last thing what we did was, what we intend to do was, when we are talking to our clients, we, we were of the mode that there are different type of clients. We understand there are do-it-yourself customers. There are clients who know, they don't know. And there are clients who don't know, they don't know. So how to deal with them? There are 50-year-old uncle G's who, want, who doesn't want to deal with technology. 
so we we are there on for through our touch model but there are a set of clients who want to only deal with tech so how to bring personalization there with all these data insights the complete journey we we, we try to make it a personalized one uh, experience so that uh, omni channel experience is visible to all sort of clients that's what we try to do that's great and i mean i just want to highlight that you know while you covered it in two sentences and said we brought all the data which was sitting in silos together and that's called data lake it's not simple right it in Absolutely. a financial services organization that takes a lot of will and not just of the marketing team but i think people at the top and people at the board level you know yes. wanting to do it and i think the second thing you spoke about was the change in the model of business uh and you know there is a study that ibm has done across uh, the world in 80 countries 20000 cxos uh, were polled uh, including ceos and cmos and the number one important thing that everybody wants to focus on is that our business model needs to change for us to succeed in future and i think that's what you're really talking about so that's a great work that you're doing and you know you spoke about touch and tech and i'm going to later on come to sarika to talk about the digital thing that we were talking about but before that I think before we come on to Amit and he has some very interesting IoT stuff to talk to us about I really wanted to cover a concept called cognitive enterprise anybody here who wants to uh, have a stab at uh, telling me what is cognitive enterprise no sure okay see cognitive enterprise really is the enterprise of the future which 100% utilizes the data that's available inside that organization uh getting insights from that and then doing the customization and personalization and therefore it's not just about technology it's about therefore the business model change creating platforms and also becoming agile as an organization to ensure that we are able to change our business model basis the data insights that are available to us right so world of the future is going to be very different and yes i'm going to talk to gulrez about that also he's going to tell us what are some of the fantastic things you know happening elsewhere in the world but before that i mean i think you're in a very interesting space with the kind of things that you're doing uh you were telling us about neuro tagging yeah so tell us more about the kind of work that you're doing as a as a as a marketing team uh that was also what was interesting for me so uh basically uh cisco as a brand belongs to fmeg category which is fast moving electrical goods and as we all know that you know it's a category which is fundamentally uh, in that sense offline because you go and buy products from the retail presence that the brand has for you right now when you talk about uh, marketing automation i think for us the process of marketing automation begins when the products are iotized so example uh, two years back uh, you know we launched uh, a smart bulb which was uh, you know app controlled and uh, we successfully launched one app because of which we were able to you know understand who is the consumer who is buying it and what is the kind of integration that person has with my product but then uh, you know i think that was just the beginning for us as a brand because we realized that as we speak today i think it's not only about uh, a smart bulb which is the most low hanging fruit but also a lot of these iotized other consumer durables that we have as a brand to push out in the market and and bring that convenience to you as a consumer so right now you have your smart doorbells your cameras your fans and whole lot of other things so for us as a brand what we did was we uh, you know we created uh, the app uh, which is called as cisco smart home app which gives you the power to control all your smart products through just one app and i think with this interface what we have done is we have understood the customer we have understood as to what all we can do in terms of cross selling the product and 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 make the entire customer life cycle value optimized and coming to neuro tagging that i was just mentioning to you backstage um i think it's a concept with which we are able to you know hit two buttons at the same time uh one is to ensure that uh the consumer is buying the authentic cisco product because in the market you have lot of these first copy second copy products so the idea is very simple uh, i give you one qr code which you are supposed to scan uh, when you are at the retail counter and uh, this successful scanning will tell you whether that product is authentic or not once you get that confirmation you have the opportunity to actually buy that product and actually scan another code which is inside the box which will actually help you to in fact get additional warranty so i think these are the you know little ways with which we are able to create uh, digital footprints for the brand 
and uh, take it up from there. I think that's, again, a great example of what a cognitive enterprise of future would look like. But I think the important thing here is, Amit, the fact that marketing is playing a role in doing this. So it's not the manufacturing team, it's not the QC team, you know, it's not just the technology team. But I think it's marketing who is getting direct access to this kind of data and doing plans uh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, for utilizing this data. Correct, that's and true. I think, I mean, that, that's why I kind of brought in the cognitive enterprise space. And, uh, you know, Gulre is therefore on to you. So, uh, you know, as I'm looking at, you know, uh, uh, travel and financial services are typically considered in India the fastest, uh, you know, uh, adoption of digital. But, you know, with IoT, uh, some interesting work is happening. And I can tell you, I know Sagar was here uh, just on stage earlier, the kind of work that uh, IBM is doing uh, globally on blockchain. Uh, you know, with the food retailers, where you are able to track food from, you know, farm to the table is very interesting work. Uh, I don't know if Rima is here today, but, you know, she works for Obroy Reality, a friend of mine, and the work that they are doing with 3D printers, um, you know, in the reality space uh, in Bombay uh, to ensure personalization. I mean, it's just phenomenal work that CMOs are doing. Uh, you know, so the interesting thing is that this is not a tech conference. The interesting thing is that this is a marketing conference, and we are talking about it. So, Gulrez, tell us what more is going to change for us in future. Before um, I paint the future for you, let me congratulate you first because it was IBM in 1992 which launched the first marketing automation product called Unica. Yes. That was 1992. And the next product that came out was in 1999, uh, which was Salesforce and Oracle product. Um, just to circle back to what Tushar said, uh, we are actually a provider of those platforms. So in technical terms, what Tushar was saying was about remarketing. Um, and and uh, what we do with the two brands that we own, which is either Vizuri or Revex, we're the largest provider of remarketing uh, platforms in India. Uh, so let's say you're wearing a beautiful necklace and you don't buy it. If you're browsing it on, online and you don't buy it, have you noticed that for the next three days you will yeah. continue seeing that ad? Absolutely. So that's what's done by us and likewise for travel clients as well. Um, one interesting, not future, but in present, that, uh, an offering that we got from Singapore to India is the problem of offline attribution. Uh, now, the biggest challenge for uh, CMOs, or especially the digital CMOs, is that my brand is getting exposed on the online media, but the customer would end up walking to my store and buying that product offline. Now, how do I connect the dots? That my brand spends are going online, but the consumption or actual purchase happens offline. So we bought this product, which solves the online to off offline attribution. The moment you see the ad, you click on it, it will tell you that dynamic page will tell you where is the inventory of that particular necklace closest to your location. You click on Summit, you're taken to the closest store there. You walk into the store, you show the SMS or the QR code, the digital CMO gets the attribution done. So that's one part of marketing automation we're doing. Um, well, not to forget the latest buzzwords are uh, chatbots, uh, whether it's in um, tech, um, tech space or the voice space. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of, let's say, the largest bank in the Middle East by the name of uh, Emirates NBD, one of our clients as well. Um, there, they have gotten rid of the entire call center. If you call up the helpline, there is a voice bot that answers their question. And all your questions are handled by that. Not again distant future. Another example that we executed in Singapore for a group of hotel called Marriott. Typically, what, when you check into a room, there is a telephone. If you need a chauffeur, if you need a travel advice, if you need to order laundry or any other service, you would you know, do the numbers and somebody will help you. Next time you walk in, there will be a Google Home or an Alexa, and you can communicate that with person. Imagine you check into a room next time and the Google Home or Alexa says, Hi Deepali, we've been missing you, welcome back to the hotel again. Last time you were here, you ordered the Indian chicken curry, would you like to order it again? So that's the level of automation we're doing. So in, in summary, if I can say that uh, marketing automation for me is to how to um, create the hyper-personalized uh, content. That's really bad.
That's interesting. Again, another data point from the uh, CMO study that uh, IBM does every two years. 2,000 CMOs polled. This is 2018 data, though. And only 58%, although it sounds like majority, but only 58% said that they're happy with the personalization efforts they're able to make. So there's a huge scope for uh, change and improvement. With that, I'm going to come to Sarika. Sarika, we spoke about digital. And you and I both come from, uh, you know, the tech and the B2B space, uh, uh, you know. So I want you to talk about what is the interesting work that's happening in the B2B space uh, when we talk uh, MarTech. Sure. And, you know, it's very interesting. Different industries, we have CMOs here, but so different perspectives. Um, you know, uh, in a B2B kind of a scenario, uh, there's so many differences when we look at customers. Because one, the buying cycles are very long. It could be, uh, it's never days, by the way. It's always months and sometimes years. Uh, the value per deal uh, is never in a few thousands. It's always... Uh, and if we are lucky, then it's in multi, multi millions. Uh, the other part that is very unique is that in B2B, what we, the challenge we face is, you're not talking to one customer. The buying is actually influenced by a set of uh, people. And they could range from, you know, the procurement manager to the, you know, business head to the chief digital officer. Or it could even be sometimes legal teams who are, you know, enabling or directing a sale. So really, you know, it's very difficult to segment one particular uh, or, you know, identify one particular persona. I think the uh, part that we've done very successfully at Capgemini over the last uh, few years is, uh, you know, build the entire uh, piece from, uh, you know, awareness creation itself and map the customer journey right till the part of, you know, when they become our clients and then ongoing and a repeat sale. And, uh, you know, like Vishwajit said, really, that, you know, they've combined all the data. We've been able to do some part of it, but like you said, uh, Dipali, it's, it's, it's a humongous task because data resides in different, different pockets. Now, what do I mean by saying, you know, very simplistically that we've mapped the whole journey? For us, really, the uh, sale is largely driven by content and it's largely driven by thought leadership. So, you know, uh, at Capgemini, we have a Capgemini Research Institute, which produces one of the best content. In fact, uh, I, I wish I were part of that team, but I'm not. <laughs> really, um, you know, we've been awarded the best, uh, you know, uh, leadership content for the last two years by independent agencies. Um, this content needs to go in a snackable format to the right person at the right time. Uh, we also have a lot of people who come to our booths. We participate in various, you know, uh, conclaves and exhibitions uh, to demonstrate and showcase our uh, offerings. Uh, we need to be able to know, you know, if this particular customer has been on our website, is the same person coming to our uh, uh, booth, is the same person requesting for a meeting. And when they come to us for the meeting, what is it that they are, we should present? So we have been able to do that automation. We essentially use Pardo as our uh, core automation. And it doesn't stop there. You know, really once they have decided or they are nearly decided on, uh, you know, uh, shortlisting us as the final vendor, we have them come over to India really to also uh, see the place where they, the delivery is going to be done. So from the client visit team, that's also the part that I manage, uh, we have intelligence in knowing that they have come and visited us. There have been so many touch points. And we also are able to use tools to help us know what are some of the social profiles of these customers. So what are their preferences? If the client is from France, what are some of the things? Who are they connected to on LinkedIn? How is it that, what, who are the influencers in their journey? So I think we've been able to bring a lot of it together. I would love to say that we have a single view, but that's not true. But I would be able to say that we've been able to bring these pieces together. So today, the multitudes of clients, uh, the different personas that influence uh, uh, you know, a technology sale, uh, we are able to map and give them customized content and customized experience. That's really the big change for us. Yeah. I think also, I just want to say this, uh, as a CMO, what has changed for me is the amount of KPIs that I have now to deliver on. So in the good old days, you know, you had the brand health monitor of some nature yeah. and you had some, you know, when I, especially when I was in FMCG, you had, you know, a reach number surrogate somewhere and your sales happened and your profitability. Yes, you need to manage, uh, you know, the profits. And now if I look at my KPIs and I'm bringing this question to all of you, okay, if I look at my KPIs now at IBM, I of course have the brand health monitor. I of course have the social scores, you know, on the brand 
hand side. But uh, I have the I have the leads data that I you know I'm handing over to the sales to close, and I'm also kind of an e-commerce uh, head because you know there is a lot of business that you're closing through telecallers or you're closing online. And you're doing this for uh, about 10 business, uh, you know, BUs. And so 10 multiplied by some, you know, six wearables. I'm, I'm so, uh, you know, it's a very interesting thing. I'm always uncomfortable because one or the other number is not getting achieved in the quarter. Okay. <laughs> so there are some 80 or 90 wearables that drive my goal sheet, you know. That's the change I have noticed. And it's across. It's not just at IBM. I mean, that started happening when I was in insurance. That started, I mean, that did happen when, I, you know, I was with the travel company. Have you also seen that kind of change? change any one of you and I mean we don't need to answer for each one of us but have you seen that change yeah that change has happened and largely uh, with digital it has happened yeah. uh, like earlier Sagar was saying that you know uh, offline marketers are not held responsible for for the results but digital marketers are so with digital yes with trackability lot of lot of challenges have come and uh, a lot of KPIs have increased and uh, uh, Business is the ultimate KPI, but as a marketers, we ourselves create a lot of KPIs for ourselves because uh, because we we are working with multiple channels and each channel has a KPI, right? So yeah. so we have to achieve those KPIs first. That we do for our agencies, right? Yes, <laughs> I was just just yeah, about I, to I, say. Don't worry, I will get you to talk about it. <laughs> okay, I want I want Amit to talk Dipal, about just this. Just to whole? add yeah, yeah. what you were saying in a very sophisticated way. Huh. 20 years back, it was that they ad an ad, right? <laughs> and then, times change, they said lead generate karte hai, BTL, se, <laughs> digital, se. but now, it's totally different. Yeah, yeah. Now it is, what is the customer experience and across the journey? So that is what the major KPI is, 30% is that. Apart from business, from the portal which you, which you are running, where a lot of investments promoters have done, so they expect you that you are cross-selling, you selling hoga. you have a huge data, so what is the what numbers? Is the, yeah. <laughs> How about you when you're doing this whole fancy IoT stuff? Uh, you know, what do the KPIs look like? Yeah? <laughs> See, I think uh, while you definitely have sales and leads and, you know, cost of acquisition, you know, hounding you, uh, for me, the additional parameter is, uh, am I able to increase the customer lifecycle value? So today's so example, yeah. when you look at LED, Yes, while it is majorly offline, but I have certain uh, segment brands which are very online in that sense, maybe say, example, personal care. So my uh, task here is to say, okay, fine, you create the journey with uh, millennials, as they call that, right, uh, who are very online in nature and uh, create a footprint and ensure that, you know, tomorrow when they will mature, they need to buy LED from your same brand. Yeah. Uh, again, maybe five years down the line when they mature again, right, they need to maybe buy another brand from you, which is in yeah. the category so, of wires and cables. Yeah, right? sorry, I'm going to interject. So for, uh, I have to say this. I think customer lifetime value as a concept, the earliest existence of that was insurance companies. Yeah. And agencies also know that, right? Gulrez used to be my agency at one point of time when I worked for insurance. So it's interesting to see those concepts are coming over to, uh, you know, uh, other yes, industries. Yes. yes? Gulrez, yes. How do they make your life miserable? <laughs> you know, so what happens is that the moment you get additional KPIs, we have to co-own those KPIs. Absolutely. <laughs> so you know the challenges that comes along. So it's yeah. just have to explain it with the example. I think Tushar was talking about user acquisition or lead generation, right? That's one part of it. What happens next is, as a provider, we are asked that how do we validate the quality of the leads? And now there are two ways. In traditional world, we would pass the lead to our call center. They would validate. They'll send you a report. In today's system, I have built an automated system. When the moment lead comes in, there are filters applied. I would rate it between 1 to, let's say, 10, depending on the industry, and it will automatically get filtered. We're talking about, let's say, lifetime value. Now, when the client comes to us and says, we've got to figure out a way to increase the lifetime value, now we are the platform provider, right? What comes here is that, how do we make sure that the customer cohorts that we are talking about, we show them the communication where the repeat purchase is much higher. So eventually, all the KPIs that CMO has and the amount of increase that happens, yeah, we have to deliver that. But it's a CMO's neck on the block, huh? <laughs> Sarika, you want to talk about interesting KPIs at Capgemini? <laughs> I, I, I'll be very brief here. I, there, of course, the number of KPIs has just been growing exponentially, but there's another number called budget which has been decreasing exponentially. <laughs> so that's, I think, uh, you know, the uh, enhanced marketing automation really plays a very big role 
because these are two uh, finite numbers and we're not going to, yeah. you know, I mean, there's never going to be, um, you know, uh, unlimited resources. So I think uh, in the context of exponential KPI growth yes. and the uh, reduced budget, I think marketing automation really is something that we are counting on extensively. Yeah. yeah. And we, we spoke also about investment, therefore, right? All this, uh, uh, you know, the technology investments that we're doing uh, require a commitment from the organization to put uh, either CapEx or OpEx, you know, into it. How has been your experience, any one of you, on that? Uh, I think for uh, a category brand like us, I think uh, the investments are very high. Uh, because, you know, you are actually shifting the entire uh, portfolio from a regular one to something which is uh, going to be uh, the most in thing in the near future, right? So I think uh, when you look at the whole uh, iotization of your product, the whole AR, VR game of communication, it's a big investment for us. Uh, but yes, we know for sure that, you know, uh, it's going to give us good returns in the next one to two years of time. And after that, yes, maybe more additional KPIs will come and hit me hard. <laughs> So, when you get the investment out, 12 months after that is smooth sailing. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Gurdas, there's another question that I only wanted to ask you. You know, I think uh, uh, for some time and uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier when we used to work, I at least as a CMO felt that my agencies always come and taught me new stuff, okay? And uh, uh, a meeting at the beginning of the year or, you know, planning phase, new things that are happening, okay, programmatic is coming. I don't know if there's somebody in the room over here. I once landed at a programmatic master class and they all said, oh, but you know, this is not for CMOs, this is for your children, this is for your children, so I have to learn. Okay, so uh, uh, is that still the case? You know, uh, are the agencies still uh, bringing in new stuff uh, to the clients or are the clients walking ahead? So it depends from the vertical you're talking about. So for example, if you talk about the e-commerce vertical in India, I would sincerely say that the clients are far ahead because that's their bread and butter. But a lot of other businesses, apart from e-commerce, even the app-first companies, um, is the value that the agency brings to the table. It's about the innovations happening either around the world or in different industries. So what is the agency can add value to you as your partner, as your trusted partner? I think that is... Uh, necessary for the agency business to survive, right? And even for a company like Apple, we're a platform provider, so we have to keep innovating. We have to come up with newer and newer and newer ways. I think I'm going to quote um, uh, one of the um, sentences that you use in your article, uh, which is related to marketing automation, which is like, there is no AI without IA. Right? So there's no, no artificial, artificial intelligence, intelligence without, without information, information architecture. architecture. So That's how by do you... the way our chairman Ginny Rometi's uh, sentence that we all use. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just another interesting thing. So, what, what industry is there for? I mean, there clearly seem to be a life stage, right? E-commerce is ahead and the other industries are behind. That's interesting for me. So, Tushar, if you're in travel, which I consider to be advanced, who do you look up to? Or where do you look up to new things that you know somebody else is doing and I'd like to adopt? And you and I were in a retreat together where we were in any case doing cross-industry learning, right? So who do you look up to? Which industry? And I'm going to come back with that question to you also. Uh, see, see, a lot of things uh, that some industries like CPG are doing, uh, uh, tra industries like travel are not doing. But largely it is related to the margins that everybody has, right? Travel has very thin, thin margins. That's why we are very, very ROI focused. And, you know, uh, marketing automation, we, uh, rather than calling them projects, we should call them experiments. Mm -hmm. So they are experiments for us more than uh, projects yeah. because if yeah. we see the success, then will we move forward. But uh, the stuff, uh, some of the uh, uh, CPG clients are doing on social media and in terms of uh, brand building, that's the kind of stuff we would love to do and travel has a lot of scope, but, you know, budgets don't allow. Okay. Uh, but you know, budgets are a reality. In fact, there is a tip for anyone of uh, the marketing fraternity. How many of you are from the agency's side here? Not marketing, not the client side? Most of your, most people here are clients? Very few agency hands went up. Okay. So if you're looking for your next job, no, you should ask that company, what's your gross margin? Work for companies where the margins are higher. <laughs> You'll have more scope to do things. <laughs> okay. Vishwajit, how about you? So some of the industry which up? we look upon, see, it's the same customer what I feel who's doing a booking of a movie in a book my show, who's going out and, you know, dine out. So the kind of experience he's getting from different apps, I think you have to live up to that same experience. So 
we are in in way we are competing with almost all the you know fintechs of the world uh, all the tech companies and absolutely india is not uh, so financially aware so a lot of educational sector which we you know the way the byju's of the world have evolved and where they are educating people so i think we are more you know trying to learn from the, those sectors more great sarika you want to answer that question which industry do you kind of try and draw inspiration from he is ahead of the curve he is doing iot okay <laughs> well actually um, more than look up to another industry what i think and sundar in his uh, morning presentation uh, from adobe actually alluded to that that the biggest challenge for service companies really is the you know having a very distinct uh, uh usp or you know how do we differentiate ourselves you know because in a product you have product features and you can have one feature which you can really distinguish and you know kind of amplify that but in a services organization you know really the solutions that you're offering are pretty much same it's just the client's experience and the client feedback that really makes a difference so uh you know the the challenge for us would be to learn from those organizations those service organizations who are able to really create a distinct uh you know usp or a distinct identity for them uh which is then not clonable by you know uh sure. within the industry sure. thanks very much we've got about 7 minutes left so if there are questions from the audience uh before i ask my question i'd love to have your questions anybody wants to raise their hand and has a question for any one of them or for me no i don't know what they're waiting for over here either we were very clear or they didn't listen to us at all <laughs> I know I didn't I didn't kind of ask this question to you Gulrez who do you look up to I know you're doing newer things and uh stuff so where where do you draw inspiration from oh man that's a difficult question so um as I'm sure most of you are aware um Apple got listed on 8th of August and in this kind of a market we were oversubscribed by 86 times wow do we really have to look up to somebody else no so uh, good luck Gulrez full marks for that thank you <laughs> Uh, Deepali yeah uh, so here kavya yes. uh, so apparently mitesh has a question should i pass the mic to him yes please absolutely i you know it's maybe the light and i can't see there for earlier sorry but i'd love to have that question yeah yeah so yeah we are talking about marketing solutions and uh, in the, in one of the sessions we were having that what is a future is a cmo or a cto as a future because it is very tech driven marketing uh, at the same time we are seeing as uh, our friend pointed out that actually the shift in consumer behavior towards buying from like a book my show or amazon or flipkart or something so the consumer behavior by buying on marketplaces is far simpler than you are going to google generating a lead and then lead, filling a lead form getting a call from a call center getting hawked by sales guys here and there it's a, it's kind of a yellow cab kind of experience versus uber so where, and uh, unfortunately what is happening is actually we have been seeing that the huge number of sales are being now been slowly moving on marketplaces like amazon and flipkart So over a period of say five years, if eighty percent of the sales really move out there, what's the future of marketing? So what's the future of a CMO or marketing? CMO. Okay. CMO or a ma ma. Can I can I just respond to that now? So I'm specially working on a project which is uh, quite futuristic and answers probably your question that in the world of voice, when you have let's say Amazon, Alexa. Next time you want to let's say ask to uh, book my show to book a ticket you don't go to the app you say to Alexa can you book me a ticket for this movie now as a platform provider how do i ensure on that platform that the platform Alexa is booking ticket from book my show let's say if for bajaj capital or for thomas cook if you're asking for find me the cheapest ticket between bombay and delhi how do i as a platform provider on the voice ensure that thomas cook or let's say a particular provider is coming up first so a lot of interesting stuff is happening worldwide um but yeah some of the snippets of the future if i can provide yeah yeah i'm going to answer that right because that will be the fumes and fences of bezos actually wherever you get higher margins again just put the mic closer we can hear you so the you being the top 3 in the, in the alexa age we're talking about that alexa age is going to come where people will say hey alexa book me an air ticket and how do you ensure that make my trip is among the top 3 you answered yourself yeah. whoever pays is the highest yeah, yeah. So j- just yeah. to add dipali cmos stand for customers basically you know so what is the they are the best one who understand they are the custodians of the customer in the organization so what are what kind of a customer experience or you no know, let's say how you emotionally connect to a customer so tech is there 
बट यू नो आंसू कौन निकालेगा अगर इमोशनल करना है क्लाइंट को यू नो सो सी एम ओज विल ऑलवेज बी कस्टोडियंस ऑफ यू नो डेटा कस्टमर डेटा एंड दैट इज वॉट इज गोइंग टू बी यू नो ड्राइविंग देन लेकिन अगर एटी फाइव टू नाइनटी परसेंट ऑफ सेल्स है मूड आउन टू मार्केट प्लेस Why would brands so I, I, will also an, I, I will also answer, but I just want to check: Is there any other question? Another question. I There's not. Yeah. So let's get that question, and then otherwise offline, I'll talk to you. What will happen to CMOs? <laughs> It's scary, but. Hi, my name is Saurabh Jain. I'm from Asian Paints. My question is to Tushar. Uh, so you were telling about retargeting or cross-selling to the customers who have already purchased a domestic trip, and uh, telling them about international trip. Yeah. While people plan their trips, they generally. form a certain trend as in they generally tag their friends about whether you want or you are ready to go to on a trip or they discuss on whatsapp or they search things on google and share things on uh, travel websites etc are we today in a position to track our existing customers what are their activities online and then target them when they do not know that we are tracking them yes. so uh, so we not entirely uh, if their social profiles are public then probably you can scan what they are actually doing otherwise uh, you get buckets from all these technology providers and you have to believe in those buckets but uh, i am not sure how accurate they are so it, uh, i personally think from my mahindra holidays days it's a it's a process of transition we're getting better at it uh, but to answer your question no we're not completely able to do it yeah i Any can a, add yeah. to that yeah. a little bit being well, the right technology we'll can do provider it. <laughs> there are only two ways you can solve this challenge because in typical terms you call this multi touch attribution right even on the digital only if you are signed into google which is your gmail id only then through the google analytics 360 pro- platforms you can provide otherwise if you are on the app piece if your sdk is integrated then you can monitor the performance as well there are only these two ways yeah but, yeah, but you, you know, have to I mean, build models on it yeah but i think from the point of view of the asian pains uh, i understand where you're coming from the question that he asked and therefore he asked this to tushar i think uh, where you don't have apps and uh, you know so it's a tough one so yes uh, it's not perfectly possible any other question kavya okay good we have yeah no i'm just looking at the timer which i can't see when i'm sitting so hi uh, i'm pramod i'm from kotak mahindra bank my question is uh, there are two point of views right one is uh, single view of a customer you get to know the customer and uh, you reach out to him this is his requirement his or her requirement the other view is reach okay you reach out to maximum number of people and then you will get automatically get your business okay there are different views in this and definitely in this two views traditional media also lies okay we are we are talking here d- digital everywhere but what is the role of dig- uh, traditional media in this automation do you see traditional media was also Uh, walking hand in hand with this or it's actually walking apart and we are forgetting the traditional media or it has lost its importance can you want to answer or i will answer no no go ahead no you go ahead first uh, there were solutions before the gdpr comes in right so there were ways that in the offline world we would understand that uh, your device is present in front of the tv and through a technology called beacon uh, technology we will be able to understand that you saw the ad let's say at least on the tv not the outdoor and while you watch that ad we know you are a user so we will trigger ads but with the gdpr being here uh, it's difficult to do that there are a uh, lot of fixes uh, some of them are called tv sync advertising so what we do is we multiply that effort so somebody who has seen your ad on tv how can we expose the same brand in the digital or the mobile world there are some solutions but still very early days you know and i just want to say this from a market planning perspective if i'm a cmo if i'm a cmo of a brand who has to reach billions and millions of people i would still look at the very large reach uh, medium and not worry about what they're doing so it's you know the traditional reach and frequency question okay do the reach and then use the single view of the customer for the small segment of people who kind of you know enter the inner circle for you that's how i would do market planning so i do think that tv may not have a role to play uh, when it comes to businesses maybe even mine at Uh, you know ibm in that sense where i am only talking to a smaller set of people which is you know in few thousands or millions so that that's the way i would uh, look at market planning 
Uh, of course, combine that with, you know, what Gulrez said. Uh, our time is up, so if there are any more questions, let's carry on this conversation. Uh, most of us are on Twitter. I know uh, Sarika is, I know Vishwajit is, uh, I know Tushar is. Um, and I just want to answer that one question and finish, uh, you know, the discussion there. We've had this whole conversation on marketing automation. If CMOs don't keep up and don't become uh, chief data officers or chief client experience officers or chief omni-channel officers, depending on which industry they're working on, they're going to be out of their jobs. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's where I think it is going. And I think our jobs are becoming very different. They've already changed. I'm doing a very different job uh, from what I was doing, uh, you know, 10 years ago. We may still be called chief marketing officers, but our, uh, you know, jobs have changed. And therefore, we need to learn. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, there's a very, uh, there's a book written by a professor at Columbia, Rita McGraw. She uh, talks about how businesses are losing competitive advantage. Her last chapter is about how as... Uh, professionals, we are also losing competitive advantage uh, very quickly. So, uh, on that not so happy note, uh, Kavya, over to you and a big hand for the panelists over here, please. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dupali, and thank you very much to all our panelists. If I may please request you to come together for a group photograph.